Good morning and welcome to the first in a series of e-commerce international expansion webinars. We here at uh, GTM Global are really excited by the prospect of doing these and we're delighted to launch this first one today. Before we start, I just wanted to say that we've actually uh, recorded this earlier this morning and so what you're going to hear in very shortly is a half an hour session with some really interesting and powerful experts on e-commerce international expansion and we uh, look forward hopefully to hearing uh, what you think because at the end of the recording we're going to ask you to uh, put some questions back to the mentors and the experts who were here earlier. Um, they're all online, so uh, at the end of the recording, which will start in a second, please hang on because all our experts will be able then to respond to your questions um, from their own desktops. Anyway, welcome to GoToMarket Global e-commerce webinar and uh, we're going to change over to the recording now. Good morning and welcome to this GTM Global e-commerce webinar. My name is Ian Collins, co-founder of GTM Global. And today I'm joined by an esteemed group of industry experts to explore the opportunities and challenges for international e-commerce growth. Before we start, I'd like to thank everyone on the webinar today for joining us. We've had a huge response. We're broadcasting this morning from Vader Media HQ in London, and we have a lot of material to run through from market entry and customer acquisition, to e-commerce and sales taxes, and on to delivery and returns. In effect, the complete e-commerce journey. As we've run through the webinar, I'd like to encourage you to send in questions and feedback via the webinar chat, and we'll bring these together at the end of the panel discussions to do a full Q&A session. So, without further ado, let's get going. I'm going to start by asking Bobby Tulis, Group Marketing Director at GFS, to provide an overview of the Tame Bay market research which GFS recently commissioned. Thank you, Ian. So, um, this, the, the research is still going on, so what I wanted to share today were just some key headlines so from the preliminary findings. So, this is a research we did with Tame Bay where we wanted to go out to UK retailers, online retailers, especially in the light of exit and re uh, Brexit. and. Um, get their perspective on what they see as the main opportunities and challenges for growing international sales outside of the UK and specifically outside of uh, the EU. These were retailers sort of ranging in sizes. I think the majority, 63%, were between 1 million and 10 million turnover, so fairly sizable businesses. Um, mainly in e-commerce businesses, online businesses, with 83% of, of them saying that at least half of their revenue was online. Okay. When they were asked about what, where they saw the main opportunities in terms of markets, um, top three markets that they felt had the biggest sales potential, first and foremost was the US with 64% saying it ranked as their number one. They saw that as a number one opportunity for potential growth, e-commerce growth. That was followed quite way behind by Australia at 17%. And then the third one came in as China, 14%. So interestingly, the, the first two are all sort of, you know, English, la you know, English language speaking. Um, big difference between the US followed by uh, Australia. China's in there, obviously it has to be. It can't be ignored, but it's, you know, 14%. So top three markets, US, Austria, Australia, and China. Um, into when they were asked about how important or critical growing international revenue was to them, 76% you know, said that they felt that this was absolutely critical, right? and they felt that over the next two years, international revenue would grow significantly. So it's clear that their direction you know, from, the, from what the findings from the research is that they're telling us that Top three markets, the US is the number one, followed by Australia and China, no doubt about that. That growing international revenue is critical for success. They see that growing significantly over the next two years. And that there's also an urgency, probably you know, with the pressures of Brexit, whatever, but there is certainly an urgency around doing that, and they expect to have to make these changes over the next two over the next two years. So that's the 
direction, you know, what they're saying is the direction they want to be travelling in, but then the reality is very different. So when we asked in terms of today how much of um, their revenue is coming from outside of the UK, for the majority, 30%, only 1% to 10% of revenue currently is international. So they still have a major dependency on the domestic, on the domestic revenue, domestic market. When asked about which countries they currently sell in, 98% are selling in the EU. So again, big exposure risk around the EU. Um, so what does it tell us? You know, what are the key takeaways from this? What we see is that they're saying there's a need and an urgency to grow outside of the UK, and specifically outside the, the EU, that they want to grow those international sales significantly over the next two years. But the reality is that today there's a big gap between where they want to be and where they actually are. When we probed into trying to understand what are the top three barriers, you know, what are, what's hindering them from getting to where they are, um, number one, they felt that the top ranking challenge they felt was the complexities around duties and taxes. So 38%, the number one challenge was duties and taxes. That was followed by 29% saying that complexities around delivery, so getting parcels, getting orders delivered into markets was, a, was, the, was the number one challenge. And then the third ranking challenge was around lack of marketplaces. So this is where retailers are saying that they have, there is a lack, either because there is an absence of, of um, online marketplaces in those countries, or they're not aware of which marketplaces are in those, in those countries. So this is online marketplaces. So 19% said their biggest challenge was lack of online marketplaces in those markets. Fantastic, Bobby. Very, very revealing, and especially with Brexit, uh, very topical at the moment. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Robbie Deeks, Director of E-Commerce Revenue at uh, international digital agency Vayner Media, to um, tell us a little bit about his findings in the top three or so challenges that you see in the work you do at, at Vayner. Over to you, Rob. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So the top three challenges we see when we work with, so, so Vayner, for context, works with a lot of Fortune 100, Fortune 500 brands, but we also work with fashion option retailers and basically a lot of businesses, um, as Bobby mentioned, that their, their next um, growth engine is, is geographic expansion and, and identifying markets um, around the world to expand into next. Um, the challenges we we see facing these brands, whether they're startups or product innovation um, arms of the CPGs, um, fall into three uh, main buckets. One is first properly segmenting what markets to go into first. So as Bobby mentioned, there's data around a lot of interest in the US um, or, or China or Australia. Um, and oftentimes, you know, as a small business or as you're expanding to new markets, you have to choose where to start. Um, and so one of the things we see challenging these businesses, how do you use a data or methodology to identify which market is actually best, not only based on your products, uh, but also based on your team, the DNA of your team, uh, and the resources you have to allocate towards uh, new market expansion. Um, the second would be um, proper channels and uh, resource allocation across those channels. So. Um, you know, if you're going into the U.S. market, are you starting on Amazon, um, or are you starting on, on Walmart and a DVC approach, or do you do brick and mortar? Um, and, and so, uh, so often every market has its own nuances based on the brand, based on the category, and so uh, an often large challenge for these brands is understanding where to first invest their dollars, um, and that will give them the most success and return early on to then grow and invest more. Uh, into that that uh, growth opportunity, um, uh, and then the third would be having the actual proper team to execute in each market. So, uh, a lot of brands that we speak with, they're always saying China, China, China. Um, but having us, you know, having worked and having two SVPs that have grown, um, you know, multi hundred million dollar brands or billion dollar brands in those regions, uh, you have to understand that there's it's a fast changing uh, marketplace. You need to have not only local context, but understand how do you take a European or American brand into those markets, 
and then even uh, around operations, what you're going to need differently to uh, to be able to execute on. And so when when we look at really uh, a lot of these uh, challenges, it all starts with the company itself, what their goals are as a company, and, and reverse engineering those goals, and then going forward with a strategy based on the market and the DNA of their their team. And is there a temptation to go into a new market <coughs> and experiment and explore and look for sales first and foremost as opposed to perhaps building your brand presence and looking at a medium to long term play? Of course, yeah, and it, it, it ultimately comes down to the individual company, uh, the type of company they are, and, and again, their goals, right? So if you're a Fortune 100, Fortune 500 CPG, you have targets you have to hit um, when you're in that world. And so there's a large default towards um, you know, investing in a retail approach, or sometimes I see people in large CPGs in a position where they're, they're built to fail, where they, their uh, you know, management says, you know what, we're gonna invest in e-com, so they go in the region e-com, they don't execute proper resource allocation or underinvestment, and then they don't hit numbers, and then you know, unlike the management said, that person's out of a, a job, Twelve months later, at least out of that role, and so there's a real balancing act. I think with the people on on this call, um, a lot of them are still privately owned companies, and they're not, you know, answering to the the public markets every 90 days. So I think there's a huge advantage in that alone to really be patient when you're expanding these new markets, and really take a uh, a method uh, a logical. Um, data force approach and really test different acquisition channels when you're entering. Uh, so you, you're, you're setting yourself up for the long term and you're not putting all your money towards media dollars. And then when you understand that consumer based on uh, the opportunities you have to collect first party data, you can really go into the brand approach and build fans in that market and really understand what fans mean in Dubai versus the US and double down on that versus just trying to go in for sales first. So w what would you say then is the, the typical if there is such a thing as a typical success criteria, what would you say that should be? Is it about the number of fans you have? Is it about your revenues or your profit? How do you drive that? What should be the focus as you enter the market? Sure. For me, I think with these brands, you know, between you know, five million and fifty, it really has to be success around uh, efficient customer acquisition, um, while not deterring your brand. Meaning, a lot of uh, historically, a lot of people would enter a country uh, or a new market via brick and mortar to drive sales. But we've seen the cost of slotting fees and, and trying to break in brick and mortar, and really putting the business in a vulnerable position by even having to up, upfront invest in stock and local warehousing. Whereas, what e commerce and marketplaces allow them to do is identify who that consumer and fan is in that marketplace or early adopter of their brand and then reverse engineer what channels they're going to be buying from. For some products, that's going to be Walmart before Amazon. For others, it's going to be Amazon. And in some cases, it's going to be DSC or very boutique um, you know, brick and mortar in, in New York or Seattle. First, you have to understand what market you can play in, and then you reverse engineer the channel from them. And then you really always want to play a different game than what everyone else is playing, because you're not the only one trying to enter the US market. So you can't just think Amazon's going to be the ultimate answer without doing a bit of your research and understanding whether organic uh, growth uh, exists. Okay, fantastic, uh, Robbie. That's a really good intro to the market side of the uh, e-commerce opportunity. What about the um, sales tax and the pricing and the whole piece around customer experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like you know, like Bobby said, you know, the vast majority of businesses operating outside of the US want to get into the US. It's a massive market. There's 300 some odd million people there. Um, so I'll focus on that initially, right? So as a non-US business looking to trade in the US, the first thing that a business needs to do is identify their exposure. Um, and in the US, the, the sales tax regime um, has what's called a sales tax nexus, right? Which is really just a fancy way of saying a connection between your business uh, and a local or state jurisdiction that triggers a filing obligation. Um, this filing obligation can be triggered by a number of different sorts of activities, right? So uh, you're holding goods in a state, and that triggers a filing obligation in, in most scenarios. Uh, if you've got uh, brick and mortar stores, if you've got um, sales reps, if you attend conferences, if you 
um, just travel visit a client, right? So if you go to, to Idaho or Florida for more than one business day in a calendar year, you have a sales tax nexus there. Um, California, a little more lenient, I believe it's about 15 days. Um, but the idea really is just, or the takeaway here is really just identify, yes, you're trading in the US, but do you have a filing obligation? Um, and the thing is, is that in the US, there's no federal sales tax. It's all governed by the states and the local jurisdictions. Um, so you have to really have to think of the US as 50 small countries, each with their own rules and regulations around, around sales tax. And it's wildly complex. Um, you know, once you do find out you have a nexus in maybe one, 10, you know, 40 states, whatever it might be, um, you then have to worry about the 14,000 different tax rates in the US. Um, and for a business operating across the US, it's an absolute nightmare. Right over here in Europe, we've got maybe you know a handful of rates per country. You've got a standard rate, reduced rate, super reduced, etc. Um, in the U.S., you you have to stop that thinking. Um, it's just what happens, Jake, if you if you get it wrong, if you don't uh, fully understand what's the, what's the, the, the likely consequences? Yeah, absolutely. So um, most states are in the red, right? As many governments are, um, and so they're increasingly aggressive with. Uh, Audits, uh, increasing penalties. Um, there's actually uh, information sharing packs. Uh, there's four of them in the U.S. Uh, there are four four regions. So you've got the Southwest, Northeast, South, Southeast, right? Um, and basically, if you get audited in, in Florida, they can then share that information with Alabama, right, and Georgia, and the neighboring states as well. Um, and so, you're once you get audited, you're on a list, right? Um, and so. With that results in, there's a, a lot of penalties, a lot of audits. I mean, most audits cost north of 100, 150 grand um, for the average SMB, uh, but that's that's being pretty generous. Um, so the larger the business, the more the exposure, the more your penalties, interest, and fines are going to be. Um, and you know, states get creative with how they come after businesses. So um, it's it's pretty wild. And how does how does this whole issue around tax manifest itself for the consumer? What what happens if you get it wrong? Yeah, so oftentimes, um, you know, if you overcharge a customer, um, they're going to dispute that. So uh, Dunkin' Donuts um, got audited by, or not audited, but they got uh, a class action law lawsuit put against them a couple of years ago because they were overcharging customers on donuts. Um, so a terrible was, thing to do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they were supposed to be charged at a reduced rate because it's a food product, and they were charging you know, more than you know, the rate was supposed to be applied. Um, so yeah, made national news. It really put the sales tax to the front and center for large uh, you know, food and beverage companies. Um, then obviously under collect or sorry, um, not charging sales tax at all will also get you in a lot of trouble. Um, so states want their money, right? They've got coffers to fill, they've got roads to build, schools to fund, right? Um, and so if you're supposed to be collecting sales tax and you're not, again, it comes back to the audit risk. So there's there's two risks, right? There's the consumer risk of over overcharging. Um, there's also the the odd risk of of not collecting at all. Uh, but the idea is that you need to be charging a sales tax when applicable um, for your consumers. And if I'm a consumer and the brand has got that wrong, do I end up with a bill when my parcel is delivered? So, so for yeah, so for goods being shipped from outside of the U.S. into the U.S., um, yeah, there's a de minimis value of eight hundred dollars, right? And if your if your item is over that de minimis value and subject to the duty rates to enter the U.S. Um, at the point of checkout, right on your web store, you, sh you should be able to present that amount, right? Because what you don't want to happen is, you know, if someone orders a five thousand dollar watch off your website, you know, they're really excited to get it, uh, then they get a note from the customs agency that says, you know, you've actually got to pay, uh, got to pay an extra, I don't know, two hundred bucks, right, to get it cleared for customs. That's a terrible customer experience. I know a few people who actually we work with um, who have refused to pay the, the duty amount and just automatically have the, have the product sent back to the, to, to the, to the business overseas. Um, happens frequently, uh, but it results in a negative customer experience. Uh, sure, sure. So while some businesses are scared to present that, that duty amount, that checkout, because they think, oh, it's going to deter business, well, would you rather have deter business or a terrible customer experience and then that, that consumer then tells their friends and other you know, folks online, leaves bad reviews, et cetera. So um, you know, got to weigh your options, but ultimately, Streamlined customer experience is, is the way to go. And uh, to, to Robbie's point as well about uh, fans and ensuring your fans are following you and building that fan base to get your brand recognition and the right messaging around that. Obviously, if you get that wrong, it's a, a really negative impact on, on your, your business. 
Yeah, that tweet can top your empire, right? So you never know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as Donald Trump may or may not <laughs> come to know. Um, Bobby, can I ask you a yeah. similar question around the sort of um, the challenges that you see in the sort of delivery and the returns mm -hmm. space there? I think certainly from our experience, you know, we work with most of, you know, the majority of sort of UK retailers across all different sizes, and I think there's three sort of like common challenges that come out. I think the first one really is um, is retailers under, you know, recognising that they need to localise their delivery strategy. They need to understand that from country to country there are different um, there are check, there are differences between. Um, there are cultural differences and there are network differences when it comes to delivery. So, for example, in Spain, it's not culturally acceptable to have a parcel delivered to your neighbour and accept them to you know, expect them to be happy about taking delivery of it. You certainly wouldn't leave that parcel on the doorstep and expect that not to be stolen um, or for it to go missing. However, in, in Germany, you absolutely can do that. It's absolutely okay for you to be able to specify that you can leave your parcel with a neighbour or that you can leave it on the doorstep. It's not going to get stolen. That's perfectly fine. So there are cultural differences, and it's about, just like with anything, whether you're looking at your marketing strategy or your sales strategy, you know, what you do with your website, you need to localise your delivery approach. And for that, you need to really understand what those local market differences are. And also, markets vary in terms of infrastructure, maturity of infrastructure. So, in most European countries, it's absolutely okay to use sort of like the local postal services. You know, there's a mature infrastructure, they've got strong networks, so sending a parcel through that is going to be relatively safe. There's some countries where that's the opposite. So, you would never use um, local postal services if you want your parcel to get there. You would, in that situation, you would use courier services, express, something definitely tracked. So it's understanding what those local market differences are um, and making sure you adapt your delivery approach and your strategy in line with each of those, those countries. The second thing, which is common across the board, and we still see it in the research, is that you need to offer, whether you are talking about your domestic customer or your international customer, you know, especially in the online environment, they want choice of delivery. Right? You need to offer them a good breadth of choice of delivery options. The reason being is because consumer lifestyle is all about speed and convenience. In fact, sometimes it's not even about speed, it is about convenience, because not everybody wants the next day service. They want, actually, they don't mind waiting five days, but they want it to, to, to arrive at, their, at the office or to and pick and it up at the local it. supermarket, yeah. right? So it is about, Retailers, if you want to be successful, you know, it is about being able to offer that breadth of choice of delivery options. What we see where things go wrong is where the majority of retailers, and this is supported by statistics and research, still will offer fast or slow. So your next day service or your three to five day service. The majority still offer two options. What we see is that if you can increase the choice of delivery options, your car abandonment rates go down. And we see that happen with retailers when we work with them to increase that breadth of choice of delivery. So that challenge is all around being able to, to provide that breadth of choice of delivery options. And then the third one is just as you need to make sure that part, you know, the consumer gets the experience they expect in terms of being able to choose the option that suits them best, and have the confidence that their parcel is going to arrive when they expect it to arrive, they also expect the reverse of that, which is when it comes to returning their parcels. And again, this is a big challenge for, for retailers, especially as we see you know, trends uh, showing that more and more online, especially in fast-moving consumer goods, more and more um, consumers are to expect to be able to return. Those, uh, those parcels. It's become so those the norm, the, yeah, it's yeah. become the norm, and we, you know, you hear in the industry, especially in fashion, the bedroom becoming the the changing room. Yeah. Um, so those, I would say, those are three things. You know, it's being, it's adapting your delivery strategy to localize it to what the local market is like. Um, critically, is giving customers 
your online consumer, your customer, that choice of delivery option. Let them choose what option is going to suit them best. And if you get that right, that is going to have a direct impact on, on your sales revenues and car abandonment rates. And uh, make sure you've got, a, a, you know, it's a, addressing the challenge around how do you make it as easy for customers to return their parcels as it is to receive them. Very important. Thank you very much, Bobby. And uh, Simon, you lead on the international trade at Tech UK. Do you have a perspective on this discussion here? Sure. So, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that we're seeing e-commerce obviously go from strength to strength, and uh, latest figures have it at eighteen percent of all UK retail sales are online. But the the interesting thing is that ninety three percent are still touching the physical world. So, what does that mean? That means that. 93% of transactions are at some point the decision has been informed by interactions with the physical world, whether that's going and seeing it in a store or being recommended by a friend and then visiting it with them. And it means that businesses need to be smart about how they approach this and they need to look at multiple channels. We have a member called uh, Farfetch, which is really um, becoming a world leader in bringing the bricks and mortar experience and matching that with online shopping profiles. So what they do is they um, aggregate data through an opt-in service, of course it's opt-in now in the GDPR world, um, and consumers will sign up and say look we're happy for our data to be analysed, both what we're shopping online but also as we go through a store using technology, um, that technology will pick up what your buying habits are, what you're picking up off the rails, what you're interested in. And then when you go into the changing room, it will allow you to see not only what you've got in your hand, but also other sizes and other options based on things you've looked at online. Um, on top of that, we'll also then give you the opportunity to buy directly through the mirror. So rather than having to buy it and physically take it home with you, it can be waiting for you when you get home or arrive um, a day or a few days later, depending um, as we discussed on your shopping preferences. Um, so the ability to be able to match what you're able to do in the physical world and your online profile, what you're looking at, it's really going to be the kind of cutting edge of how this can work. Thank you, Simon. And Lorna, GS1, um, you must see a, an awful lot of organisations that are in this space. Tell us a little bit about what you see and what's happening in the GS1 world? So we've seen amazing growth in memberships. We're up to 36,000 in the UK. Um, it's about 2.5 million globally. Um, but there's, there's a big shift in uh, heading more towards like micro-businesses. The, the majority of our members are actually uh, under 500,000 in turnover revenue a year. And the main reason that they're joining is for market places. Um, so obviously their priorities are significantly tighter in terms of resources so I think um, the way that they seem to be looking at um, what to do first um, can def definitely be shifted in terms of uh, what products they sell and what the key um, priorities are for the customers based on that type of product so um, obviously the returns piece is totally imperative once you're looking at apparel products not so much if you're looking at like a, an iPhone charger so the returns piece weren't there, but also the value's not there as well. So it, it helps them to be able to prioritise what they're going to be able to do to make the most impact with the resources that they've got. Um, I think the main, the main thing for us in terms of focus for this year is, is also trying to educate the small businesses to get their um, things in order uh, at a foundational level. So certainly things like the GTIN, so the product identifier or barcode or UPC, whatever terminology you might know it as. Um, that is actually a global standard and that can take that product to whatever country you want to trade it through um, as opposed to starting to relabel once you start hitting different countries that removes the need for that. Um, we also have other s uh, standards that um, can be a bit technical but obviously this is what we're here to help with so things like SSC labels which are actually harmonised parcel labels that one um, label en enables the the product to go out and back if it needed um, with the same identifier. So we're trying to help with work with businesses so that they all work in the same way and then there's no excessive costs just by trading with each other. Sounds very sensible. Hopefully. <laughs> so just to add to 
Lauren's point about micro businesses and the majority of your new companies are, are, are smaller companies. That's happening at every stage of company, right? So the Fortune 100s um, are reacting to what we call challenger brands, right? So you see uh, all these challenger brands being acquired by the Fortune 100s to feed their growth. Um, and we see in the data, the future of, let's say, CPG alone isn't going to be those billion dollar brands anymore as much as it's going to be, you know, 10, 100 million dollar brands. And CPG understands this. And so when, uh, whether we're working with small businesses or, you know, Pepsi, historically they would enter the market and put $50 million into one brand uh, to, you know, try to get national distribution awareness in the U.S. market, let's say. Uh, now, these four to 100s, Pepsi, have to be just as innovative in the way they enter markets and be micro businesses. And so you'll see them launch all these different companies into the market. And so we help companies like Pepsi do that, for example. How do you look at um, taking this micro business approach in a company that historically has been so large um, and it forces you to get really creative, not only with how you enter market, but even how you work with the, the different teams in an existing company. Um, and, and so I think I think everyone's going through the same problem. Um, and and the, the type of work we do with Pepsi is almost the exact work we're doing with these brands that are now funded by venture capital or private equity. It comes back in a way to the point you made about you don't any longer buy customers, consumers. You actually have to win them over in some other way. You have to win them over. Um, and uh, just another point that I think, from what I'm hearing, uh, back to my third point around having the right teams. Uh, you know, Pepsi has to completely rebuild internally. That's why they're forced to acquire these teams, uh, these companies at scale, um, and teams isn't always necessarily building internally, it's also having the right partners. And sort of, as I listen around the table here, when you enter markets, sometimes it's not adding someone internally, it's adding someone externally that also understands a lot of the stuff that we're discussing here today. I guess that helps a lot with cultural change as well, exposure to other smaller organizations and different working practices. Yeah, just different perspectives and experiences in the market. I think, and just just to add on to that, that localization point and the, the bit about understanding different cultures, different ways of doing things, whether that's delivery preferences or ways to conduct yourself in the business. That we see that every day in terms of going into Japan is obviously very different to going into America, which is different to going into China, um, and even from state to state within the U.S. And we've we seen this. It's it's so important to understand what the local community is looking at, what those preferences are, in order to make sure that your brand is relevant and impactful. Very good. Jake? Uh, yeah, so we, uh, we did a, a case study several years, years ago with a company called Dylan's Candy Bar. Um, they're basically a, they're very large in the US, uh, basically sort of a candy, sweets, lifestyle brand. They sell online, they sell uh, brick and mortar. Um, you know, and they ended up getting audited by the state of New York um, every year for six years uh, because they were managing sales tax manually, right? They had rate lookups on government websites and they were keying in everything manually and they weren't taking into account things like product taxability. Um, it was just a very, very manual process. And so the state of New York, right, you get audited once, you're on their list, right? And then they just come back for more every single year and every single year they found errors and errors and, and they got hit with, um, Penalties, fines, interests, um, and ultimately they decided to automate that with uh, with Avitax, which is our, our tax engine. Um, and over the years, um, the state of New York has since left them alone. Um, ended up saving more than $100,000 a year um, in the penalties just from New York alone. Um, so they're able to automate everything. They're growing fantastically. If you go to New York or you go to pretty much any major market in the U.S., find Dylan's Candy Bar, a fantastic company, um, and a very happy Avalar customer. So. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to do a sales pitch now? Yeah. <laughs> um, Bobby, tell us a little bit more about the barriers to delivery and returns that you see in, in the business. So if we speak, if I can talk more specifically around what we see retailers really struggling with when it comes to being able to, at the point of checkout, offer more delivery options to their online customers. It boils down to internal constraints. Um, internal constraints which are around, first of all, sometimes the technology, 
Right, so technology, if they, it's not that they don't want to add more delivery options, but to do that means they have to integrate um, those services into their online platforms. They then have to be able to um, print um, compliant labels when it comes to shipping those parcels. So there is technology cost, investment, effort involved in being able to do that. So that is a pain for them. So that's one angle. The other angle is really comes down to bandwidth, operational overhead of um, adding more carriers and delivery partners, having to manage multiple relationships, multiple contracts. You know, suddenly you're tracking parcels of, across ten different delivery, you know, carriers rather than two carriers. You know, there's a, it, it creates a lot of complexity, um, effort, and cost in the business. So. Where, where does a, a brand get to in its life cycle before it realizes that something's seriously wrong there and it needs to change? Is, is there a single point where things are falling apart or customers are migrating elsewhere? What, where, where, how does that all come? I think it's down to, there's t I think there's two sort of indicators. One is where you've got retailers that are getting customer satisfaction scores. So Mothers and Puppers, for example, after every delivery, um, that happens, they automate customer feedback. So Robbie receives his crib because his wife's about to have a new baby. Um, as soon as that crib is delivered, the an automated survey will come to Robbie and it says, please rate your delivery experience. So they'll be looking at customer satisfaction scores. The other thing is, you know, smart retailers will know, will be tracking things like cart abandonment rates. And what we see through experience is that Retailers see um, a reduction in cart abandonment rates when they start offering more delivery options at checkout. So if they benchmark what their rates were before, adding more services and then track what happens after they've added more services, certainly, you know, mums and puppers, the likes of Wilco's, we can say the majority will, if they're measuring it, and that's the key thing, if they are measuring that, we'll see an improvement in, uh, a reduction in cart abandonment so higher conversion and also increased customer satisfaction scores. So if they can get the delivery piece right, which is not just at the point of checkout, being able to offer those additional services, so overcome the internal challenges, the technology constraints, the, the bandwidth constraints, the operational constraints, they can overcome that so that they are able to give that breadth of choice at the point of checkout and then ensure that they can deliver on that delivery promise, if you like. Mm -hmm. So make sure you've got really robust um, services in place, uh, that you're, you're, you're able to give your consumer visibility and trackability of where their parcel is, getting feedback afterwards. That will translate into more online sales. And, I, and I'm, I'm guessing here, but I would imagine that a lot of the uh, benefits that you described there of getting that right, the user experience, the consumer um, experience. Mm -hmm. That is almost, I would have thought, the norm now. If you're not doing that, you're not even yeah. on the map. It is, yes. And, and then the other point being is that if you're moving out of the UK to say the USA, where you know we're talking about the home of digital and, and social, where you're up against masters of digital techniques and so mm -hmm. on, where perhaps that is the norm, what is it that we have to do, not only to address those issues you've described, yeah. but also, Robbie, to you, what, what can we do to get a competitive position mm -hmm. if we are up against the masters of, of digital? Yeah, so, I'm glad you brought this up. So, one of the things that we've seen, in, you know, working with brands, you know, talk, talk, talking to more specifically to fashion and let's say, that have scaled to 100 million, almost a billion, and they did it on the back of being good at one or two things, right? Let's call it Instagram or Facebook ads. Then what happens is that they get to the scale and they've never invested in brand. They don't actually have a brand. They just invested in customer acquisition and then the channels become more and more or less and less profitable and less effective and they don't have a plan B. And so then you see those companies all of a sudden in retail and retail doesn't fit their brand or you see them trying to go international um, but it's a panic sort of reactive mode versus strategic. So when we work with brands that are say fashion luxury entering the US market, anywhere, you know, say they're doing five or 50, um, they're actually in an opportune time to really hurt these brands that have scaled and everyone thinks they're winning, 
but actually are not because those brands never invested in the community. And when you get to scale, you can't change your DNA so fast, right? So if you grew on the back of Facebook, you're a Facebook direct response brand. And if you're, if you're small still and you're entering the US market, you have an opportunity from day one to actually build properly. I think Gymshark is an incredible example of this where they built a community and so they could turn off Facebook and the media tomorrow and they'd still have those fans that are gonna come back and buy. And that is ultimately what we want to do and what businesses need to do. And that's when you get a long tail of organic and customer lifetime value. And that's a sustainable business where I think a lot of companies get caught up in the, the hype of today's VC backed company DNVB brand world, and they're missing the actual math behind these companies where they're not, you know, they're not raising that next round, and all of a sudden they're selling for a fraction of what their initial raise was. And so the key is, I mentioned this earlier, being patient and really thinking about how you're building a brand that's going to scale so, and have so, a community around that. So, so I'm, let's say I'm a brand in the UK. Can I naturally take what I've done in terms of my fan base here and what I've done with my brand and positioning here? and then just pick that up and put it in place in the States or in the Far East, wherever. I, I know that's a leading <laughs> question, but you know, what, what, how critical is that? Then? Do I have to start on that journey again? It completely depends on the brand, the industry, it's the persona. Global. For example, we're working with a very luxury sort of watch um, brand trying to break into the US market. Uh, and they came to us and we said, this is not gonna work <laughs> in the US market because you're, you're not respecting, A, the existing competition that exists there, and you're trying to go about it in a way on channels that don't work in the US. And it's gonna cost you a lot of money, but really what you should be leveraging is the fact that you have a story of authenticity that people will buy. The fact that you're from you know, Switzerland and you wanna go to the US, People want that, right? Or certain customers want that. And so you have to be able to communicate that and properly um, you can get in the right channels where you can acquire these customers. You don't have to play the classic game that everyone else is playing, which is throw millions at media and never actually build anything of substance. Actually, to add to that point about brand, there's, there's, two, um, there's two points I'd like to discuss. Brand, Considering what your brand stands for is also going to influence what your delivery strategy should be. So, for example, you know we work with high-end uh, uh, female fashion. So, you know, like L. K. Bennett or Meta Porte. Now, their delivery strategy is aligned to their brand and the brand experience they want their customers to have. So, they don't offer slow. It's going to be FedEx. It's going to be the Prime Service, Express, Tract, all of that. Um, so, again, when you Think about your brand and what that means in terms of what kind of delivery options you, you want to give. Um, that's that's a really important point. And I think the the other thing is, of course, is that sometimes your brand can be your advantage. So we have um, we work with a, a relatively, when I say small, they're sort of like one to ten million. No, actually, they're ten million turnover. So you may have heard of them, Hatton's Model Railway. So if you're a a model railway enthusiast, you'll know Hatton. So classic story, come from bricks, started in 1946, selling, after the war, selling uh, used toys, and then suddenly discovered this market for train aficionados, and has grown fantastically, and the majority of their growth has come from the US, because they've leveraged their classic British brand and found their fan base. Mm -hmm. And we've seen them grow Phenomenally, over the past two years, they've been growing 20% year on year mm -hmm. because one, they were able to get their brand straight, brand strategy right, tap into that market and get their sales channels right, but also they were able to open up those markets by getting the right delivery and services into those markets. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, the punchline is brand is everything. At the end of the day, when you look at the amount of private label Amazon's doing and able to do and manufacture their own brands and have the customer, and then every manufacturer, it's so easy now to start a company. And everyone, every manufacturer has their own brand, every private equity VC is investing in them. If you don't have the brand portion, then someone's gonna win that, that space. And if you're talking about channels, Amazon, if you watch Amazon Choice and you know, think about Alexa controlling the options in, in three to five years of you know, order me paper towels and then they recommend Amazon's private label, you need brand at the end of the day.
Okay, folks, that's a good place to pick up on the Q&A now. Thank you very much indeed for uh, some really great questions being posted. I'll start with um, a subject matter. Richard, Simon, Jennifer, thanks very much. Uh, good questions around budgets and cost. And uh, Robbie, if you're with us, I'd like to start by uh, putting this to you. The question is this, well, the gist of the question is this. You've mentioned, Robbie, the need to build your presence, to tell your story, to win fans, and to explore different channels. How long does that realistically take, and what sort of budget do you need? So, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the, the answer is it, it's going to depend, right? But um, when working with such large companies, their, their goals and targets in the first 12 months are obviously much larger than the many of the companies that we're speaking to today. I think when we approach new markets, we're always looking in sort of a 12, 24 month roadmap and breaking that up into sort of six month uh, milestones and increments. Uh, in terms of budget though, a typical, uh, often brands will invest anywhere between uh, you know, 500,000 all the way up to um, a few million investment while breaking into a, a new region. Um, I think the, the, the goal needs to be how do we drive success early enough or show signs of success and, and what do those KPIs look like so we know to keep investing or not in, in that region. Okay, Robbie, good. And um, I have uh, Mazer. I, I hope I pronounced that properly. Um, how do you find the right products and price point? Sounds like a, another question for you, Robbie. Sure. So, I mean, at Vayner specifically, we launched an entire division called Vayner Brand Innovations and Launchpad. So we've acquired the talents of um, the former global head of innovation for Unilever and former global CMO of L'Oreal, where we've built entire market studies on, on the U.S. market. Um, around sort of consumer behavior and customer segments. So we sort of have a, a leg up when we're doing this type of work for customers. But I think when you're doing it in sort of a lean startup way, one of the great things about uh, e-commerce, if you, if you have any existing data, is just sort of looking into um, who's trying to order internationally before and, and you know, simply trying to have conversations in that market with that type of customer persona and asking them, and really just building um, a bit of your own research uh, around uh, around your sort of thesis on who your audience might be in that country, um, and then testing it. Good answer there, Robbie, thank you for that. Here we have Daniel says, I want to increase the number of delivery options I offer our customers, but we're not sure it's worth the time and money and the effort to do it. What difference do you think this will really make? And be honest, Bobby, can I ask you to field that one? Yes, I'm happy to give an honest answer. So you're asking what difference is going to make if you can give your customers more choice of delivery. So when they come to the online checkout, what they see is not only the sort of standard slow three to five day delivery service options, but also uh, all fast 24 hour next day, but also things like click and collect. Uh, nominated day, nominated time, um, so that they can they can decide if they want to pick up their parcel when they nip into the supermarket to buy a loaf of bread on their way home. What that gives them ultimately is convenience, and convenience matters a lot to your to your consumers, and we we see that we know that we we are consumers ourselves, so we understand that. That's going to translate directly into lower cart abandonment rates. Um, higher customer satisfaction scores, and also repeat sales, so greater sales revenue. But I also understand why you sort of hesitate, because in order to to do to offer more choice of delivery, that's going to require you to um, go out, find more carriers, know which services to provide, set up those contracts, manage those relationships. And that takes time, money, and overhead. But also there's a technology impact, being able to integrate all those services, not only on your e-commerce platforms, but then your back, you know, the back-end operational systems, your order management system, your warehouse management system, your, your, your labeling platform. And again, that's, that's time, cost, and complexity. But the good news is that you can find smart ways to do this. And my checklist that I would sort of um, share with you would be, look for a delivery partner that's more than just delivery. 
So a partner that provides value added services around not only um, expertise and advice on which carriers and services to use, but a partner that can set those relationships up, manage those relationships and even offer more competitive ra- rates through, through their buying power. But that's on the delivery side and the services. You still need to be able to integrate those services into your technologies. So again, look for a partner that not only can provide the services, but also can enable those services with technology tools that will enable you to integrate it with your e-commerce platform um, and also with your back office systems. In fact, look for solutions such such as um, GFS Checkout, which are already which already have those existing integrations built in so that you can avoid costly, um, timely, costly integrations like that, but also come pre-configured with all the different carriers and services, whether they are domestic or international. So that's going to mean, you know, make a big difference in terms of the cost and complexity of integration of those services into your technology platforms. I've got another one here, uh, Simon. I hope you're on the call. Yeah, um, I'm here. Great. It looks like the uh, our audience here liked your piece about Farfetch. They'd like to know whether you have other examples of companies using tech to deliver a better solution or to deliver more competitiveness. Can you help us with that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, amongst our members, some of the companies are finding uh, increasing demand for services from e-commerce businesses, which are looking to automate and improve efficiency of their businesses. Um, we're also seeing a number of sort of data analytics solutions and big data uses. A um, couple of examples, and I guess so. IKEA has partnered with uh, the company Artificial Solutions to develop. Ask Anna, which is, well, they call it one of uh, IKEA's most versatile employees. And that's been developed in conjunction with artificial solutions over the last nine years or so. Um, Ask Anna converses in 21 different languages and assists customers um, throughout IKEA's website. Um, another example would be Pythian, which helps clients solve complex IT problems and handles their critical data systems. Uh, so, for example, a major online retailer partnered with them on vendor selection for a public cloud platform. Um, it's also helped to modernize the data warehouse of global retailers uh, with advanced analytics, which were able to put massive volume of in-store behavior data to work to market the client in a more targeted and effective way, uh, and ultimately increase the consumer base and shopping satisfaction. So, I think different ways in which um, technology can really help improve the the way that um, companies can offer e-commerce solutions to their customers. Fantastic, Simon. Good to hear that. And Robbie, you seem to be very popular this morning. Mary wants to know what sort of conversion rates to expect on multi-channel advertising in the US. Yeah, so I I, I don't know if it's the, the sort of right way of looking at things just because that's really going to depend on every vertical um and and specific to the channel that you're looking at i think more importantly you just want to um really be looking at uh testing multiple channels at once and and comparing uh what's going to have the uh sort of more organic reach over time and what's having the best conversion in, in the short term to help drive sales um but i never we never even get into conversion rates with clients early on uh um, outside from my immediate sort of click through perspective, but again, it's really channel to channel um, that we're comparing that on. I guess also, uh, Robbie, maybe that question was about the differences you might experience from the UK. If our campaigns, our ads are producing a result of X in the UK and we move over to, say, the US, can we expect to see similar results? Do we have to reset our objectives and our thinking there? Yeah. Okay. Understood. So, uh, yeah, I think I think I think in certain channels, uh, as well, and some will work better. For example, uh, influencers. I think in the U.S. market are a great way for any brand entering to execute. In the U.K., they just don't have the same uh, effect, and so I think very few brands leverage them the same way. But when entering the U.S. market, uh, it's definitely something that I think is probably one of the lowest hanging pieces of fruit and underpriced attention. And also will build sort of your your social assets in terms of Instagram and, and things of the like. So 
uh, that'd be one example where conversion rates would be, you know, much, much higher and something worth investing in when you, you enter the U.S. market. I think probably we've got uh, a few more questions, but we're running out of time now. So I'd like to draw it to a close. I'd like to thank everyone who's uh, joined us on this webinar today. Thank you very much for uh, attending. I hope you've got something from this webinar. And I'd like to say, as Mark indicated at the beginning of the, the show today, that this is part of a series of e-commerce events that GTM Global runs in association with its partners. And on the 26th of September, we have a, a follow-on clinic actually running here at Vayner Media in London. And the clinic is an opportunity for people to come along and to take a deeper dive into not just looking at the challenges, but also looking at some of the solutions and getting some tips and advice from the, the panel and other experts in international e-commerce expansion. So that's the 26th of September. It's an afternoon event. You can join us for lunch and some networking, and we'll have a great lineup there of uh, partners and mentors to give you one-to-one -one discussions and opportunities to look at your specific issues and challenges. So that brings us to the close. Once again, thank you very much for everyone for attending. And to our panel, once again, thank you very much for your contribution. See you all again soon.